some way or other to the farm. And the only way to do it was, of course, uh, get the glossy brochure and keep it my poor old dad, who at that time was running a Mark I Ford console. Edwin's pester power paid off, and life on the farm would never be quite the same again. It was the beginning of a lifelong love affair with the family car, which he still drives to this day. On the farm, I hadn't got many luxury items in those days, and I think it was just a little bit to make my life light up. I think really that's why I really wanted one of these cars so desperately. Heartbeat, why do you miss when my baby kisses me? As a boy, Edwin was put in charge of looking after the car. He kept it spotless inside and out. But when the car first arrived, he was only 13. So his next mission was to persuade his dad to let him drive it. Dad was a bit reluctant. He was sort of um, very cautious over his vehicles, you might say, really. He spent a lot of money on it. But however, yes, I was fortunate enough to be allowed to have a drive around the yard and change the gears, first gear, second gear. I could even hit top just on the bit of concrete around the back there. Edwin spent four years practicing driving around the farmyard. So by the time he was 17 and took his test, he was quite an experienced driver. When I passed my test, great day. It meant that I could come home and I could get behind the wheel of the Zodiac. And my father was really a little bit reluctant, I think, to let me off alone with it, even though I'd looked after the thing for quite a few years already. So the first trip was to visit the grandparents down in the village and driving down the road, got the wheel, I was in charge, on my own, and absolutely magnificent. I, I really enjoyed that. After they married, Derek and Sylvia traded in their beloved prefect for the new Anglia, one of the next generation of small cars produced by Ford at Dagenham. The Anglia was, to me, the epitome of style because of the the grace of the cut on it. I mean, I had never known what style was in a vehicle. I mean, it was metal or four wheels that you drove. But impressed as I was with the prefect, the Anglia was just wow. I need love, love. Derek and Sylvia's love for their new Anglia grew as strong as it was for their prefect. Their car remained at the heart of their relationship. The only difference was there was now a new addition to the family. Well, Sylvia was sat in the car with the baby and looking after the baby. I'd jump out the car with a, with a wash leather or a, a polisher <laughs> and start polishing the vehicle. So the, the, the Anglia really followed on from the prefect and, and, and I think it would be fair to say it was looked after every bit as well. Yet despite the popularity of Ford's latest models like the new Anglia, the American-owned company still had an image problem. Their cars were perceived to be cheap, flashy, and unreliable compared to a truly British-made car. I always remember a neighbor of mine coming up to me one day when I'd bought my first car, which was a 100E Anglia, and saying, oh, you bought a Ford, one of those tin things. I mean, what do you mean, a tin thing? He says, yes, he walked up to the bonnet and bumped it up, and I said, it's made out of tin. And it just summarised the general feeling, you know, British cars were made out of steel, hand, handmade, whereas American cars were tinny, mass-produced things. To improve their image, Ford targeted one of the fastest-growing new spectator sports, motor racing, as a way to give even more glamour to their brand. By racing for Britain, Ford hoped to promote their national credentials and provide the ultimate guarantee of the performance of their cars. They teamed up with racing car specialist Lotus, and by the mid-60s, the Ford Lotus Formula One team had become a force to be reckoned with in motor racing. The man who masterminded the reinvention of Ford's image was public relations boss Walter Hayes. His next step was to move into saloon car rallying. In a male-dominated racing world, he realised the publicity value of signing up a pretty young woman, Anita Taylor, from a well-known racing family. I had a phone call from Ford, from the competitions manager at the time, and they invited me to go down to Dagenham to meet the boss. And that was Walter Hayes. At that time, he was a director of Ford, and he was 
very forward thinking. Anita won her first race driving for Ford and right from the start attracted much publicity. She was determined to prove that she could drive with as much skill and courage as any man. The first corner in any race is frightening. There's cars all around you and you want to get to the corner first. I love the feeling of speed, the satisfaction of doing a good lap against the men being getting fastest lap was exhilarating excitement and danger went hand in hand this was Anita's first big crash I don't remember a great deal because it happened so quickly that everything was going wrong very quickly and I thought oh dear this is it I've had it came to a halt and couldn't believe that I was still, I thought, OK, I was feeling my legs, my arms. I felt fine. I was absolutely amazed that I hadn't been badly injured. The only thing that bothered me as a female was I didn't want my teeth knocking out or my face scarring. <laughs> Typical female. In the early 60s, Ford planned to develop the ultimate new family car to sell across Europe, and a race began between the design team at Dagenham and the rival Ford of Germany plant in Cologne. Dagenham beat off the competition, but before the car could be signed off, it needed final approval from American bosses in Detroit. We had got right to the end, everything was going fine, management in Britain had approved everything, and tooling had even started. And the tail lamps were what we used to refer to retrospectively as the Chinese eye variety, where the fluting down the side of the body turned round the corner of the back and went down in a slope and across the back and up again on the other side. But American management came over for the final signing off and told us that uh, the new fangled way of tail lamps in America, in the American cars, were the, what we used to refer to as dustbin tail lamps circular tail lamps and I was given the job to change the tail lamps to the circular one which you now see down there. The car was the Ford Cortina and now there was another race to get it off the production line. This began at the new foundry at Dagenham which was geared up for a huge production drive. But the work remained hazardous which meant accidents happened all the time. One young lad, he came to work with us pulled his flask in one night and it slipped off the roller and removed his finger and then um, whipped him down to the medical. That was a memorable night for me because about two hours before I had become a shop steward. So this was my first accident. When we got down to the medical, the, <laughs> the medical bloke said, have you got the finger? So we went back to try and find a finger and somebody said, oh, I saw so-and-so going down there with uh, get the finger giving it to the cat. The grim humour of the men who endured these harsh working conditions turned to anger, however, when the management increased production targets and speeded up the assembly line. The speed of the conveyor in the new foundry was 18 foot a minute. And then one day, this very genial superintendent came up, you know, it had been somebody's favourite grandfather in appearance. And he, he said, from Monday night, he said, we'll be speeding up the conveyor belt to one, 21 feet a minute. And uh, I said, um, cautiously, frankly, because I wasn't sure how, how much support I'd be getting from the rest of the men, and I was a shop steward at the time. I said, get stuffed. Dennis had the full support of his fellow workers. So when the management refused to back down and insisted on the new line speed, they all started to go slow. We carried on for six weeks until eventually the company conceded, you know, they were not going to win this particular battle. They reverted to the 18 foot. That's when the company realized that they had not only lost the battle of the speed of, they'd lost the goodwill of at least 108 very good workers. One of the new bosses who would have to deal with some of these issues was about to arrive at Dagenham fresh-faced from university, Ian Gibson. 
And the first thing that struck me was you turn off the main road and you're in the Ford site. And you kept on going down this road in the bus. And you kept on going down the road in the bus. And you see a thing that says Dagenham Engine Plant. You get inside it and the offices are at the other end of it. And you find yourself walking through a factory, which at the time was the biggest factory I'd ever seen in my life. And it was a machining plant because they're making engines. So, so the air is full of that peculiar mixture of uh, machining fluid and, and fine metal grit. Walking down through this haze, and there's enough haze that you can't see the far end of the building that you're inside. And you're beginning to think, what am I going to do in a place like this? Uh, but at the same time, there's excitement because production processes and that many people working and machines going have a rhythm and a pace of their own that sort of enters the blood. The Cortina was a big hit, and in its first year, Ford sold a quarter of a million of them. The Dagenham plant worked round the clock to satisfy demand, a pressure that led to constant disputes over pay and conditions. The negotiations were a game that both management and unions always had to be seen to win. Shop steward Dennis O'Flynn's main adversary was American boss True Hayford. On one occasion, he and I had a confrontation over something. We had this eyeball to eyeball in every sense of the word, and he backed off, went down to his office. I followed him into his office. We finished our discussion there, came out the office, we started to walk down the corridor, and he came to his door and he shouted out after me, you know, and let that be a clear understanding. I turned and ran back, kicked his door in. No one, look, look, he said, for God's sake, allow me to save face somehow, will you? And that, that was it. You know, he was a showman. <laughs> and, but you, you, you couldn't help but like the guy. The brash American cars of the 60s set the tone for the American managers at Dagenham. They brought a new style and pizzazz that made a deep impression on the young Ian Gibson, working his way up the Ford management ladder. Working for Ford in the UK was really carrying a bit of the US culture around with you. As a member of management, you normally called your bosses by their first name, and they normally called you by the first name. Uh, in that part of the 60s, in most of the UK, it was all Mr. This or Mrs. That or Miss So-and-So but it was Ian and Julia and, and Fred. You know, that's the way Ford worked. But despite the relaxed management style, there was huge ambition and no room for failure. That's very compact, Keith. What power do you think it'll put out? That sort of Americanism in thinking sat pretty well within Ford because it had grown up that way. It would have been uncomfortable elsewhere. And you got some real characters, you know, you'd get the guy who'd come over, who was the Texan, who still wore the cowboy boots black underneath his suit, and he'd sit there in the office and put his feet up on the desk, and you'd see a pair of cowboy boots arrive. Now, I bet that didn't happen in Cowley. Each successive Cortina model proved more popular than the last. Marketing played a vital role in this success, and Ford had one of the most imaginative marketing teams in Britain. They used constant media exposure to create a sporty image for their cars. One of the architects of Ford's media campaigns was Barry Reynolds. The public perception of this new range of cars was that all Ford cars are really fast. All Ford cars are really sporty. But also, we recognise that for specific models, the real route to follow to demonstrate its strength and its quality, um, durability, speed, rallying was the route to go. The rallying success of the Lotus Cortina brought a halo to the entire Cortina range. With the Cortina, the time was right to go and do endurance rallying. We went off and we won safari rally in East Africa. Touring cars, we went off with the Cortina and, and won various championships around Europe. For Clark, a wet but winning first in class, and his teammates making it a fine two and three as well. The big thing about rallying is that it goes all over the world and you can visibly display your car competing in the snow of Sweden